Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. The Lord be with you. It is lovely to see you here tonight, and tonight is all about heart. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revered, revealed. Let's begin by bringing our hearts and minds to God in prayer. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let's rejoice in the words of the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And the colic prayer for this service. God of freedom, you have broken the tyranny of sin and sent the Spirit of your Son into our hearts. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service that all people may know the glorious libera liberty of the children of God through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 45, beginning at verse 1. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Make everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive, living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been a famine in the land and for the next five years, there will be no ploughing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, 
This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother's brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honour accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen. And bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them afterwards his brothers talked with him hear the word of the lord thanks be to god the psalm for today is psalm 133 let us read it together Behold how good and how lovely it is when families live together in unity. It is fragrant as oil upon the head that runs down over the beard, fragrant as oil upon the beard of Aaron that runs down over the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon, like the dew that falls upon the hill of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded his blessing which is life for every evermore. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 11, beginning at verse 13. I am talking to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save themselves, some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered is first fruit, as first fruit is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior To those are the branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut off of an olive tree 
that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultured olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverance will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. God's gift. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they now too have now become disobedient in order that they may too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St Matthew, chapter 15, beginning at the 21st verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my father, the Heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them, they are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the pit. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart and these defile them. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away. For she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. 
He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May the words of my lips, the meditation of our hearts, be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God and Redeemer. Amen. You know, we have again this situation where there are two events happening here. Firstly, Jesus gives a parable, and then we get this extra story. Today it's about the Phoenician, Canaanite woman, woman who comes and asks about her daughter. They're put together deliberately. And I'm not talking about the uh, writers of the lectionary. The writers of the gospel have put these events together, the parable followed by this event, to reflect a practical ex- uh, reflection of the parable. So the parable is about what goes, out of, goes into my body, what comes out of my body. Jesus attacks a Jewish law. Food law was, is very strict in Jewish customs. Do you know, even today, strict Jewish practices, there is a different cutting board for meats, you have a different board for fish, you have a different board for red meat, you have a different board for your vegetables. You don't cut everything with the same knife. You even have different knives. You can't use the same knives. Do you know, I've been told, and I don't know how true this is, but Tupperware made different coloured cutting boards, not because people wanted different colours for their decor, but for Jewish people so that they could get different colours for their different meat and know which one was for which. So even today, they still follow the practices that there are meats they're not allowed to eat, They can't cut meats on the same board. So food was a very particular law. They couldn't eat certain things. It was so important. It was a religious thing. They weren't just putting bad things into their body. They were doing something against God. So you can imagine, it wasn't just how unhealthy are you. You have offended God. So when Jesus talks to them about what they put in their bodies and what they don't, he's not just talking about a health issue, he's talking about how they understand their relationship with God. He's going against their laws. What heresy would have been in that time? But Jesus is taking this to sort of understand that people had made the outward observance and taken it to an extreme that they had lost the important part of it, which was all things are done to encourage the relationship of God and the heart and the way we live our lives. And instead of actually bringing life to their faith, it had brought control over their lives. Instead of nourishing their relationship with God, they were actually turning people away because people were failing. And it was a lot too much work. I mean, really, being a Jewish person requires a lot of law attendance. It's a lot of work. It's a lot easier just to take the easy road and don't do the Jewish thing. What comes out of our hearts? You know, a title does not define what's in our hearts. Being Jewish did not define what was coming out of their hearts. The Pharisees were leading these people down the wrong path and they were leading them away from God. And we see that the act of the Phoenician woman shows exactly what Jesus is talking about. When this woman who's not a Jew comes and asks for something that Jesus says is for the Israelite people, the people of uh, Abraham, the people of Jacob, and he says, I can't give you it because you're not an Israelite. But he doesn't say that. He says, you're a dog. You're an animal. We are human beings, you are an animal. 
And she says, yes, but doesn't the animal even deserve something? And in that moment, she reflects in her heart what is important in a relationship, an understanding of what it is to have faith. She's not Jewish, but she gets it. And in that, she gets and receives what is not for her. And this is what Paul is talking about in his letter. And this is a long letter. Paul is really going to a lot of extremes. I could spend ages trying to decipher all that he wrote in here, but I'm going to try and bring it down to a simple term. He uses a plant analogy. Now, I assume, I'm going to assume, and that could be risky, that we understand what grafting in is, taking a branch from a different tree and putting it into a taproot and it taking using the taproot to grow. You can do that to change the... Um, type of plant I saw it done to a pear tree. The uh, trees were Josephine pears and they decided they were no money in Josephine so they cut the tree off but they kept the roots and grafted packum pears into the root stem and the trees had become packums instead of Josephines. There was one tree that still had a Josephine branch though. So on this packum tree there was one Josephine pear. It looked very interesting. So grafting in. Paul is in a situation where he's trying to explain that there is a dual purpose. He's firstly an apostle to the, uh, the Gentiles. His main aim is to bring Gentiles into the faith and into the relationship with God. But in that, there is a sense of dealing with the loss of relationship with the Israelites. So he's still trying to make a sense that the Israelites are not totally out. They are still in. Some of them have been lost because they don't have belief and they've been cut off the tree, but they can still come back. And the people who have become part of the tree should not become arrogant and believe that they're being grafted in because they're special. God thought that they were so special he got rid of his own branch and put them in because they're so much better than the ones he cut off. Paul is trying to say, Grafting in and grafting out is not about who we are as people. God does not think I'm more important than anybody else in the world. I am grafted in because of my faith. That is the only thing that grafts me in. It's not because I've gone out and I've done great things. It's not because I'm more intelligent than or better looking or anything else. I am purely grafted in because I have faith. And if I turn away from my faith, I am no longer grafted into the tree of God. And even if I continue to talk about it, does not mean that I'm grafted in. Once my heart loses focus from God and turns on its own path, no matter whether I call myself a Christian, stay a priest, go around the world and proclaim the gospel, if my heart is not with God, I am not grafted into the tree. It's so important to also understand that I do not bring life to God's tree. I am not so important that I can sit there and say, if it weren't for me, God's tree would be dead. I'm doing such a great job for God because look at me, I've grown this great tree for him. He would never get rid of me because look at me, I'm important. When I start to believe that I make God's tree, I misunderstand. I do not support the root, the root supports me what's the importance for us I believe we already know the importance you know I always say you can tell what a person thinks even without actually asking a direct question because people talk about what they think and feel in small comments you know What's the general social attitude towards coronavirus? I don't need to do a survey because if I go out and talk to people, they'll tell me about what they think about the coronavirus, what they think about the people who are not uh, self-isolating, those people who are doing the wrong thing. There are those who don't believe in it, don't believe it's a fact, just think it's a big hoax. You can tell. You don't need to ask this question directly. You just need to go out and listen to conversations. You'll quickly pick up what people think. So what do people think about the church? The church is lost. 
The church is not a place where we find God. Why are we not got full pews? Because people don't need God. Why not? Because the church doesn't really sell God. The spirituality of our faith is not living. And do you know what? When a church dies, it dies because it's not living. Any tree that dies, dies because it's lost connection with the root and it's not serving the purpose anymore. When the leaders of the church start misdirecting the people in the church, the church will die because there's no life in the church. It's not going where God wants it to. We bring life to the church when we talk about the church as we believe it should be, not as the way the world sees it. People in the church don't... I've, I've read all sorts of things from different parishes, parishes that are struggling to get congregations, that they want someone to go in and build up their youth ministry or they want someone who's going to grow their congregations. The question is, why do they need that person? If the church has life, if it's going where it should, the heart of God is the centre. The root of the tree is good. The growth of the tree will happen. We need to look at our hearts. What are we saying about our church? What are we saying about our God? How often do we talk about our church in a way that would tell someone, why would I become one of them? If we are not looking at the life of our church and the life of our God, we have no life. If we are not talking about the hope and love of God, why would anybody come? If we believe they don't need us, if we have nothing to offer them, why would they come? What is the heart of our parish? What, why, if it's not doing what we believe it should be, why isn't it? And how can we change it? Paul, talk, Jesus talks about the profane things of our hearts, adultery, sexual immorality, all the bad things. And we choose to focus on all the good things. But the question is, when we talk about our church, do we focus on the good things? When we talk to people about their problems, where does the church fit in? Where does God fit in? We are God's branches. We draw our life from our faith and our relationship with God, from the spirit of God which lives in us. We are not just worshipping bodily here today. We are worshipping spiritually. We are drawing and seeking to connect with the Spirit of God and to worship God in the Spirit. We would like others to come and share in that worship, to meet God and to know his presence in their life, not because we need a big church, not because we've got empty pews, but because we are drawing life and we want to give that life to others. That's the message we proclaim. That's the gift we give from our hearts. But if it's not the message coming from our hearts, we need to ask ourselves why. Drawing our life from God. Do we know what that feels like? Amen. We come now to reaffirm as a community who we believe in, the spiritual God, his gift and his life. Let us affirm our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us now pray for the world, the church and for ourselves. We come uh, at the end of each prayer, I will say, loving God in your mercy. The response which is on the back of the pew sheet on intercession response is hear our prayer. Loving God, as you once heard the pleas of a Canaanite woman for her daughter, hear our prayers for the well-being of your world and your church. We praise you, O God, that you are the God of all nations. We bring to you our prayers for all the peoples of the world. We pray for all leaders of nations, for all with political and legal responsibilities. We pray especially for your people who are pushed to the edge of society by political oppression, economic injustice, or by discrimination because of race, gender, or creed. We pray for the indigenous people of this country who have been made outsiders in their own land. Shake our prejudice and complacencies and teach us a faith that is fearless to confront injustice. Loving God in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you, O God, that your church is a house of prayer for every nation. We bring to you our prayers for all who confess your name. We pray for all leaders of churches for the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, and all ecumenical bodies. We pray for the church in hostile and dangerous places and for all who minister here in your name. We bring our prayer for our parish. Renew in us, O oh God, the zeal for your love. Let our parish come alive with the power of your spirit. Where we have failed, forgive us. Where we have persevered, encourage us. Where we are in doubt, direct us. Help us to see new opportunities for witness and service for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. We pray for those who are not welcomed to eat at your table, for those excluded from priestly ministry, for all who are condemned for unorthodox belief. 
shake our certainties and securities and teach us a faith that is open to receive new understanding. Loving God in your mercy, I pray. We praise you, O God, that you turn away none who call on you for help. We bring to you our prayers for all who are in need. We pray for the sick and the sorrowing and for those who care for them. We pray especially for all who are marginalised by disability or disease, for AIDS sufferers, for those with mental illnesses, for the elderly and those shut away in institutions. We pray today, Lord, for those of friends and family who need your healing. We remember especially Robin, Michael, Ursula Poiser, Anne Howe, Baby Odin, Peter Tranter, Jill Daniels, Brett, Bill Henderson, Damien Vale, Patricia McMullen, Kenneth Tordovan, Wendy Lindsay, Oliver and Linda. Shake our indifference and neglect and teach us a faith that is compassionate to plead the cause of those in need. Loving God in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you, O God, that you welcome home your children of every creed and nation. We give you thanks for your faithful people of every generation. We remember this week Frank Boosie, Oriel Morris, Francis Flynn, Michael Corr, Elizabeth Wade, Gerald Jerry Fletcher, Robert Badgery, Eric Reynolds, Alice Elstob. Teach us a faith that is intelligent, persistent and bold, that as you once commended the faith of a Canaanite woman and judged her worthy, we too may be found acceptable in your eyes and in and with all your people come to dwell forever in your presence. Loving God in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Let's bring our, prepare ourselves for confession through the prayer of humble access. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting them to the Lord's table.
Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins. Strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be upstanding for the greeting of peace. We draw our nourishment from the same root. We are one branch. We are the body of Christ. The Spirit is with us. The peace and love of the Lord be always with you. Thank you. the mingling of this wine and water be as the mingling of your divinity with our humanity. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. All glory and honour be yours always and everywhere. Mighty creator, ever living God. We give you thanks and praise for your son, our saviour, Jesus Christ, who... By the power of your spirit, he was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, We proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Please be seated, kneel or stand as you require for the rest of the Eucharist. Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, that we who eat and drink these may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he'd given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. And looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup, he is one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit. Unite us in the body of your Son and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, with whom and in whom in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. As this broken bread was once many grains which have been gathered together and made one bread, so may your church be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us your peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. The blood of Christ keep me in eternal life. Amen.
body of Christ given for you. Keep you in eternal life. The blood of Christ shed for you. Keep you in eternal life. Let us pray. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home. Dying and living, you declare your love. Gave us grace and opened the gates of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us in this hope that we have grasped so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name. The peace of God which passes all understanding Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace and joy to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.